There's a lot of information that exists in Excel spreadsheets, but if it's not communicated well, it doesn't get actioned, it doesn't get applied. So we do find ourselves almost acting as like an intermediary in some ways between small businesses and leaders of different sized organizations and the big data sets that do exist. Welcome back to the Business Behind Your Business podcast. It's great to be back with you after a short break. And uh, yeah, good to hear how you're going in your business journey. I'm hoping you're having a great time of it. I'm Paul Sweeney, your regular host of the Business Behind Your Business podcast. And today we have a real treat because we have today uh, a lovely lady by the name of Ashley Fell from McCrindle. She is a social researcher, a TEDx speaker, uh, head of Communications at McCrindle, which is an internationally recognised organisation. We're, we're going to find out a bit more about McCrindle. And um, I love this. She's an expert in how to communicate across generational barriers, uh, which is something I'm struggling with with four children and struggling to communicate with them, but I think we can go a bit more in-depth about what that actually means. And she's regularly been interviewed on television such as SBS, Seven News, Sky News, on radio, print, have been recently published. So Work Wellbeing, which is about leading thriving teams in rapidly changing times and Generation Alpha. Some of the feedback on Ashley as a presenter is that she is fantastic. She's warm, engaging, smart, and brings humor. You can always tell how good someone is by the quality of the questions that get asked. I've been to some of Ashley's presentations where she's spoken and the question times have been really energetic and exciting. So looking forward to this and it's a real treat. So welcome, Ashley. Can you tell us a bit more about who McCrindle is and what you actually do there? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's great to be a guest on your podcast. Um, McCrindle, I feel like we are often described as a social research agency. Effectively, it's kind of like professional people watchers. We study human behavior and analyze the trends. And sometimes in my presentations, which does often get a bit of a laugh, is I put up a slide of a nerd someone who just loves Excel. Like that's our team. We're passionate about numbers. We spent a lot of time looking at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. We had cake when the census data came out. You know, we're spending a lot of time looking at Excel spreadsheets, but really I think our passion is understanding the world around us and helping leaders to understand that world as well through the research tools that we have at our disposal, like surveys and focus groups and, you know, amazing data sets like the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics and things like the census. So we're about delivering beautiful insights. So we've got in-house designers who make that data interesting. On the back end, we're working with Excel spreadsheets, but on the front end, we're working in visualized reports and infographics. And, you know, when I'm out at conferences, which is a big part of my role sharing the research at conferences, it's custom designed slideshows. So, really about sort of helping leaders bring better outcomes in their organizations by research, by communication, and by design. So, understanding the world around us, but I guess in a more colloquial level, um, professional people watchers is what we do. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a much better way of explaining it than what I grew up with. Um, mm. So at university, I spent a lot of time with actories, um, okay. uh, being at Macquarie University, and some of them would make those kinds of topics quite dry and dull to talk about and, um, you know, eyes would glaze over. But uh, I know that you present them in a very different way. I think it's the Australia Street infographic, which has been really helpful to have a look at in, in terms of understanding just who is Australia. That's been great. Yeah, the Australia Street one is one that I think gets used in every geography class across Australia. <laughs> all geography teachers sort of say, yeah, we use it all the time because it's kind of us putting the the census results into this kind of metaphor or analogy. Like if Australia was a street of 100 households, what would it look like? And we talk about the proportion that would be married and living with a mortgage and part of different religions. So it's kind of bringing our motto, one of our mottos is bringing data to life and making it interesting and story-based. And that was the whole premise of the TED Talk that I delivered a few years ago around the power of storytelling in a digital era. So it's kind of not just storytelling, but data storytelling. And I love the brief. I actually really enjoy when people think, oh, a demographer's coming to the conference. Who's this Ashley fellow? It's going to be a boring stats person. I'm like, you just wait. There's going to be laughter. There's going to be like infotainment. You know, it's going to be interesting, but hopefully inspiring as well. So we like the challenge. We like the low bar because it means we can hopefully, you know, exceed it and help people just understand the world around them through data that's presented in engaging ways. Mm, absolutely. I think well, often when I talk to business owners about some of the advice and assistance they can get, and we mentioned that there's plenty of information available from the ABS, so the Australian Bureau of Statistics, to help them and sort of like all of a sudden the eyes roll and think, no, well, that's just too boring for us. But mm. there is a role to play for 
business owners with with this information that you've gathered from things like the census and and other sources of information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I can totally empathize and understand. I mean, as much as I make the joke that we're all data lovers, my personal love is not really with the Excel spreadsheets and that does translate into my role around speaking about the research. So I did start out at McCrindle many moons ago, many years ago as a research executive and moved into more of the communication of the insights. But yeah, I totally understand that it's not everyone's cup of tea. And if you don't have the right understanding of how the ABS works or how Excel works, it can be pretty overwhelming. Like there's a story there that's important for every business leader to know about their consumers or the different generations that they're trying to talk to or sell products to or engage with. There's a lot of information that exists in Excel spreadsheets, but if it's not communicated well, it doesn't get actioned, it doesn't get applied. So we do find ourselves in many ways almost acting as like an intermediary in some ways between small businesses and leaders of different sized organizations and the big data sets that do exist. I mean, the ABS, to their credit, has come a long way. There's lots of, I think, tools they have now that they didn't have a couple of decades ago, like quick stats, where you can just, if you're operating in a particular local government area, you can type in that. It comes up with all the stats rather than chucking you a big Excel spreadsheet where you're like, okay, all these numbers, instant turn off, see you later. So yeah, but I I think for us, we've definitely realized and we believe obviously because we're a research company, that research is so powerful because I think as leaders, whether you're leading a small business or a large organization, you know, you're tasked with that role of making decisions and making strategic decisions for your customers, for your clients, for your communities. And so often our gut instinct is an important one to think about and rest on as leaders, but research often really tests that. You go, okay, I think our consumers, they want this. And then research can come in, whether it's from, you know, data from the ABS or a survey or a focus group, and you actually get to test that hypothesis. And then you're making evidence-based informed decisions, which again, it's been highlighted, I think, to so many organizations through the course of the pandemic that we've really needed that. We can't just assume things. We need to test those. So we really do think it's research and the data available. And we've got more data today than ever before. Everyone is collecting data. Every organization is. It's about whether they know what to do with that and how to apply it strategically. So hopefully our role is to help and also to not just sort of be an organization that people commission, but also upskill, especially those small business leaders who might not have a big research budget to you know engage a third party organization, but to actually provide some upskills or some little tips and tricks here and there to understand and apply the data that they have at their fingertips. Hmm. I think, yeah, over the past two to three years now that we've had the whole COVID situation, I think a lot of small and medium business owners have become a lot more aware that they don't operate their business in the vacuum of Australia, that there are wider Hmm. forces at play and what happens in other countries does have an impact. Um, But, you know, we've talked about the Australian statistics. Do you do much with the more global side of the statistics? Yeah, we're pretty well known in the Australian market through things like Australia Street. Um, We kind of talked about Australia's, you know, leading social research company, Um, but we do a lot in the international space and we have been increasingly over the last five or so years, particularly. Part of that comes from, I think, like you mentioned, Paul, many of us have realized that we're operating in a global context. It's not like there are trends that are impacting Australians that are impacting generations all over the world. And I think the younger the generation is, the more likely they are to be globally connected, that the trends and influences are similar across different geographies. And that's not to say that each geography isn't unique, because of course it is. But particularly when we think about Generation Z and Generation Alpha, basically anyone aged under 27, they're incredibly global through technology. So understanding that market is really key. We've done a lot of international research studies commissioned by different organizations. But we also do operate a lot in that international space with regards to Generation Alpha because and it's a bit of a random claim to fame, but Mark McCrindle, our founder and principal, is actually credited with giving them their generational label. So that was one of the books that him and I co-authored last year was Generation Alpha. And that came about because he was writing a book called The ABC of XYZ about I don't know, 15 years ago or something. And he realized that nobody in his research, nobody was talking about what the generation after Z would be called. And there was no natural next letter of the alphabet to move to because we had X, Y, Z. And so he did what we do at McCrindle and he decided to survey a sample of the population. And he said, what do you think the next generation should be called? And a lot of people said, oh, generation A or generation connected. But Mark thought, let's move to the Greek alphabet. 
to signify the fact that this will be the first generation fully born in the 21st century. They began being born in the year 2010. So we're talking about children sort of 13, turning 13 next year and under. And for us, you know, we at the moment we get asked on pretty international a global scale to go and speak at conferences about them in Europe and, and America particularly. But so many people are now starting to wake up and go, oh, there's another generation after Z and the oldest of them are starting to hit, you know, their teenage years next year and they're not just primary school students, they're consumers, they're having big impacts. We talk about the metaverse and what that means for them. So future-focused organisations are starting to, to wake up and think about them. So we do a lot in that space as well. Mm. Now, that's really interesting because I think as a business owner, and, and look, I'll admit I've just hit 50 this year, so I'm, I'm sort of going the, the opposite direction. But a lot of us older people would tend to think that we'll design our business and our customers come to us. And that's been a fairly traditional way of looking at it. That, you know, you set up your store and it used to be a bricks and mortar store. And if you've got the right location, then your business would come to you. But we're doing business with people very differently and people that do everything so much differently. So like my youngest, who is just in that generation alpha, is um, being brought up, well, very much with the iPad generation. You know, everything was digital, whereas when we grew up, there was no such thing as a microwave. Nobody had a computer. So how we do business is very different. But if we're selling to those people as potential customers, if our business is trying to sell a service or a product to them, we need to understand how they operate, how they transact, how they get their information. Um, I don't, yeah. don't think we can continue to bury our heads in the sand and, and, and just ignore it and say, well, hang on, they don't do business the way we do it, so let's not do business with them. We can't continue yeah. to do that. Oh, totally. And I feel like even a big part of my role when I'm out keynote speaking, which is like the majority of what I spend my time doing, traveling, well, you know, pre and net, like post COVID, I was doing a lot of that. And it was a lot of virtual events during the lockdowns we had. But um, yeah, a lot of it is sort of helping people understand the different generations and even just getting over that sort of what we call change fatigue or change apathy, which is, again, I can totally understand where particularly older generations like you mentioned, who are saying, oh, this is not how we've done things. I don't understand these technologies, let alone the generations who are being raised on them, who've never known a world without devices and without social media, who may, and we think about it in the future. And sometimes I do this in my presentations where I say, it's very likely that a young person today will never use a fax machine, never use a landline phone. If all of our payments are becoming digital and contactless? Will they ever have a credit card? Will they ever carry an actual wallet? I think we start to realize people go, yeah, that's, I can understand that for the children in my life, that, that it's going to look so different for them. And it's just bringing people on that journey. I think you don't have to become an expert in these really future focused technologies or social media platforms, but even just an acceptance of the fact that the world around us is changing and being open and and understanding that the world shaping the next generation of consumers and employees as well and they're not just consumers you know they're they're going to be our future workers um or current workers even so understanding that they're different is i think the first the first step in it all Mm, absolutely absolutely because i know we've just hired some some undergraduates here um Mm -hmm. who are still at university and and just explaining some of the concepts i've been working in my profession for for 30 years and got very used to how terminology works but some of the concepts that we're dealing with are are very much a foreign concept Uh, i had to explain what a checkbook was (laughs) uh, and how you why you needed to have a bank reconciliation because basically uh, they're viewing that the transactions you spend it one day and it's on the bank statement the next day, whereas we had this old concept that you'd send a check to somebody and they you had to get there eventually and then they'd sit in their bank book and a couple of weeks later they'd go to the bank and present it. So those <laughs> some of those very uh, concepts are, are um, you know, quite foreign to our younger employees. So we have to change, I think, the way that we approach how we do work and how we explain things. It's come up quite regularly that you know they are a digital generation, but some of the old things like you know answering an old style telephone system is something quite new to them because they do a lot of texting they do a lot of instant messaging but not so much talking on the phone so that you know yeah. there are some differences that we've encountered which uh you know you don't expect those to come up and we've had to think about it. well how do we actually manage this and how do we train our new employees in these i guess old technologies uh, that still exist that we still use 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, it's such an interesting world to be operating in where we've got more generations mixing in our communities, in our workplaces. People are living longer. They're working later into their life. You've got Gen Z, those born between 1995 and 2009. So basically the the largest cohort sort of in their 20s at the moment and even in their late teens, like you mentioned, those undergraduates coming through. And like you're right, they're a generation that's pretty averse to kind of picking up the phone. They would just much rather send a text. But, And that's part of, I think, older employers and employees saying, okay, we understand that you've been raised in a different time. And, you know, I think it, it requires both generations to come to the party, if I can use that sort of mm. like language, because it's older generations going, okay, maybe these younger ones can help us transform our business or or help us on social media or meet a new range of customers or clients. But then younger generations have also got to learn about answering those phones because yes, we still use phones and yes, a lot of business is conducted on the phone and that's how we build relationships and trust, which is all about sales. So I think it definitely is requiring sort of these harmonious workplaces where we've got different people shaped in different times. And I like to use the movie, one of my favorite examples is the movie, The Intern with Anne Hathaway and Robert De Niro. It's a really great watch where you've got an senior citizen comes into this like young millennial workforce and he's like this older intern and they all just dismiss him and there's this intergenerational sort of conflict but then as they have trust between sort of the young millennial CEO and this older intern they realize that they're both learning valuable things about not just business but about life from each other because of their different experiences so it's not always as harmonious as that it's you know life's not a movie but if we can draw on the on the strengths of the different generations we get to reach more people we get more harmonious workplaces but yeah, the intergenerational conflict is is not a new concept <laughs> in our world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to just step back a bit because we talked a lot about research early on. So mm. how what's a practical way that a business owner could access that research and then how would they use that to to benefit their business? Mm. Well, we've got a lot of research that we have put out that we try and make available. So that's, you know, at our website, which is simply mcrindle.com. And there's lots of reports that we have written. And I mean, we again, we understand that not every business or organization has the budget to commission a big piece of research or a study about their, you know, ideal target demographic or a stakeholder study, whatever it might be to understand the needs of the different people they're sort of serving through their business. So we do a lot of sort of industry-wide studies. We've got a lot in the education sector. We've got some in aged care. We've just done a big report about sort of hybrid work and the future of work and how leaders can, even what we've talked about today, sort of lead multi-generations. It says a lot about what motivates and sort of distracts people from doing their best work. So we try and make some of those bigger set pieces available to people. And I think the first step is simply to understand what's going on in the broader world. I mean, the world's changed so much because of the pandemic. And we often say we're not moving to the next, but the new, and it's not a continuation of how things were, but almost the start of a whole new reality with regards to so many aspects and spheres of life and business. So I think if people can, if they've got the capacity to do research, whether it's asking questions of their employees or their customers, you know, even a small, simple survey on SurveyMonkey, whatever it might be, even if it's preliminary, you just get an understanding of you start to collect data and, and get an understanding of that. And we've got, yeah, hopefully some broader, bigger picture data that can complement the really industry specific areas that different organizations are working in. But in terms of how employees or workers are thinking about different things, I think it's just about engaging with it and not being scared about the data, but actually getting our head stuck in and realizing the world's changing rather than, like you mentioned, sort of stick our head in the sand, which can be a, a natural response, but maybe not the best one in these rapidly changing times. So get your hands on some data, whether it's ours or your own, and just have a play around with it and feed that into meetings, feed that into strategic decisions, share that, talk about it, talk about the implications. I think that's a really great first step for organizations who might be newer in that space, in that journey. Mm -hmm. And that's great advice because I think a lot of, well, us older business owners, you know, we traditionally, this information was not as accessible. And I think we learned to manage businesses without getting involved in the data and accessing it and actually understanding it because it wasn't accessible. It also wasn't timely. I think Uh, the speed at which the census data was turned around this time was was phenomenal really um so we have access to to live data um accessible um it's up to us to use it so 
Yeah, that's great. Now, Ashley, you mentioned the website, the Um Now, if somebody wanted to actually engage McCrindle to, to help them, how would they get about doing that? Yeah, well, we've got phones here so people can pick up the phone and give us a call we'd love to have a chat we've got our info at mccrindle.com mailbox but then we've also got yeah our website which has got a contact form on it we've got all of our team mark myself you know, we've all got linkedin so we're, we're all across the platforms and we get a lot of people reaching out and saying i've got this need i've got this problem um do you have any services that can help? And we're always happy to chat with people about that. But as I mentioned, we've also got heaps of information on our website, heaps of resources, heaps of visualized reports. So they are big reports, but they're visualized. We work really hard to make them visual. And we've got also infographics. If, if a big 60 page visualized report is daunting, we've got like an intermediary step where there's an infographic summarizing the key insights. So if people are engaging with us that way, that's great. We've also got our own podcast where we talk about the future. It's called The Future Report and I host that. So we've got a few different mediums, but um, yeah, if people want to find out more about different research services we offer, there's all those different ways to, to get in touch. Fantastic. And of course, the two books that you've written mm-hmm. with Mark McCrindle, where can we buy those? Yeah, so our first book, Work Wellbeing, which we released in 2020, so it was all about work and luckily we're actually meant to publish it in 2019 and then there was a bit of a delay and at the time I was really frustrated and now I'm really thankful that we didn't write a book about work pre-pandemic where it changed everything. So that one is available. It's a bit more of a niche book, workwellbeing.com is where people can go to find that and you can buy it online. But then our second book, Generation Alpha, is a bit more widespread. We went with a different publisher for that one and it's in most bookstores and online. We've also got a website called generationalpha.com where if people are intrigued by this next cohort coming through and we sort of use them as a bit of a window into the future, we've got a whole website about sort of them as the next generation, which is generationalpha.com. So a few websites there, but again, all back through the Macrindle website, you can find all of these resources as well. Fantastic. So we'll put links to the Macrindle website in the show notes and also links to some of those other references that Ashley talked about. So please do check those out. And yeah, look, if you have not been using data to manage your business or to help you manage your business, now's the time to start. It's easy to get started. Just a small step. Ashley, it's been great to have you on, on the podcast and I'm sure that we will get some follow-up questions on this so we'll be sending them through to you but if you do have a question please put them in the comments or email us at podcast at the business behind your business.com we'd love to hear your questions and hopefully feature them on an upcoming episode and speaking of upcoming episodes our 100th episode is fast approaching and we want to make that more about you so we'd like to know what you want us to do our 100th episode on so if you've got ideas put them in the comments again send it through to podcast at the business behind your business.com and we'd love to make the 100th episode about you and your questions because really the whole purpose of why we exist is to help you grow a great profitable and thriving business that that gives you the freedom to enjoy the things in life that really matter so ashley thank you again for your time today it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you and uh, yeah if you want to get in touch with ashley reach out through the mccrindle website and listen to the podcast which is again sorry ashley the, the future report. <laughs> the future report. And I'm sure you'll be able to find that as well as the business behind your business on any podcast player subscription service that you prefer to use. So thank you again. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Paul.